Oh, there you go. That's very uh, rubbery. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson, Richard James and Chris Dale. So nice to see you again. Nice to see you when I was passing, so I thought I'd drop in. Well, thank you. That's funny. That's me too, actually. Really? Yeah, I didn't didn't well, intend to be here. Well, listen, while we're here, yeah. and we've got these headphones on. And, uh, and these mics in front of us. And the cameras are rolling. Why don't we do a Jerry Anderson podcast? I mean, it's just a thought. do you think that'll work? <laughs> no, probably not. With no preparation? Has it worked before? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no. Well, no. it seems to have actually worked about 265 times previously. Yes. And they do say, if you want to predict things going forward, you should look at how things have gone in the past. Look at the pattern. So oh, there's dear. a downward trend. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah. we'll try and do our best to avert disaster of this whole thing crashing into the ground. Yes. Uh, can we do that? Yes, well, I'll try my best. Good, OK, well... I'm uh, only half of the equation, of course. Uh, of course. Well, I'm the other half of the yes. equation. Actually, yes. no, that's not true. Mm. You're a third of the equation. True enough. I'm one third. I'm uh, Jamie Anderson. Yes, so, I... So, well, what? I was going to say, give oh, some context. On. Oh, sure, Can I sure. do that? Context, yes. It's all about context. Thank you. Go on. I'm Jamie Anderson, son of the late, great Jerry Anderson. Right. That's all. OK, well, that's it. That's yeah, as yeah. far as you're going. With Over that. to you. OK. Uh, well, I'm Richard James. Uh, oh, I, I've appeared in all sorts of Jerry Anderson things, really. I'm in Space Prison, of course. Uh, yeah, but also, on. oh, I've written novels, uh, Five Star Five and Interpretive Risky Four. Yes. yes. Uh, and also, oh, I've done a few audio things like First Action Bureau. Yes, and... and uh, Planet of the Bones. Planet of... Bones, the Zero X story. Yes. And also yes. Jeremy Vile. Jeremy Vile in Terror Hawks. Yeah. Vile. Yeah. That's right. And title role, no less. Yes. There's good, good great titular about you. Yeah. Isn't there? That's right. Pardon? And we're also joined by. Uh, the lovely randomizer Chris Dale ah, over there on the sofa. Hi, Chris. Chris. Hi, guys. Good to, see you. Yeah, good to see you, Chris. Looking sparky today. Sparky, rather than itchy. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Mm, itchy I, last I week. Sparky. Prefer sparky. Okay. Uh, and why is Chris here, Richard? Well, he's here for the randomizer, of course. Uh, we know it's everyone's favourite part of the podcast, particularly yes. now that they can actually sit down and watch the blooming thing with him. Oh, it's such a nice thing. On the that. sofa. I do love that. Yeah, that's great. Uh, it's, uh, you know, he picks a random episode using this special randomizer what device from a random Jerry Anderson series oh. and gives us his thoughts and comments often employing a good deal of wit into the bargain. Quite a lot. And, and also, mm. just a fantastic resource of knowledge that he draws upon. Oh, thank he, goodness. He's like an Anderson encyclopedia. He is. He's an Anderpedia. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> right. uh, after said Anderpedia, what else can we look forward to in uh, the Jerry Anderson podcast yes. this week? Well, we've got all the usual gubbins coming up, of course. Of course. I mean, it'd be a shame not to while we're here. Uh, for example, in a moment, we've got Fab Facts, which I know for a start is Jamie's favourite part of the it podcast. It certainly is. Look forward to it every week, don't I you? can't Good wait. Gleam in your eye. Uh, we've got some Jerry Anderson news from our other sort of roving reporter, Jamie Anderson. He's not roving. He's always in the same place. <laughs> he is, that's true. But that'll be beamed in a little bit later on, because we'd like to keep it current. Current news. Yes. Not 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 news about currents. Not current, it's not a bakery show. It's not oh, Bake Off. Dad jokes now. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then of course we've got um, news. Fab facts. <gasps> Lee Sullivan's joining us. Oh, on Jeff Tracy's sofa for Uncle the first rubbish, part of my interview. As I call him. Why do you call him Uncle Rubbish? He started it. I don't know. <laughs> I, he, I, he referred to me as his nephew at some point, and then I okay. called him uncle, and he said, oh, "I'm your Uncle Rubbish." Great. Which is a it's, it's a it's a comedy reference, isn't it? From. Is uh, it? Yeah. Podstrons, if you know why Lee Sullivan's called Uncle Rubbish, email us podcast at jerryanderson.com. Right. That would be great. Thank okay, you. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, so he'll be uh, sharing with us uh, his first Anderson memories. He'll also be picking some viewers and listeners', listeners questions out of the Zelda mask. Yeah, yeah. 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 Which is a bit weird. I know. I'm sorry, I had, I had one job. But yeah. I, I've got a replacement okay. question container on the way. Okay, look forward to that. Uh, and then, of course, we've got our lovely Podstrons. That's you at home, listeners and viewers, who'd be getting in touch at podcast.jerryanderson.com with your thoughts and comments, and we'll be reading some of those, those out a bit later on. I'm getting so excited, I'm tripping over myself. Well, yeah, I know. Well, that's because you've got Fab Facts coming up in a second. It's not because of It is, facts. I can tell. I know you pretend every week, but Fab Facts is one of Richard's favourites. After recording, he always says, do you know what, Jamie, that Fab Fact was brilliant. I loved it. So glad we got Fab Facts. And then he pretends on the show to hate it. So if it makes you happy. Look at you and your acting. Okay, well, uh, because you hate them so much, yes. I'm going to give you a Fab Fact. Oh, I knew it! Now, time for this week's 
Fab Facts. Well, what? it's Fab Facts because you yes. love it so much. Yes. Uh, I've got my book of Fab Facts right here. There it is. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. and I'm going to flick through it, which is going to shout Fab at a random point, which will randomly stop me while I'm flicking on a random Fab Fact. Mm. I'm going to read it for you after that point. Oh, okay, <laughs> oh, but after that point. Well, I can't read it to you now because I don't know what it is yet, do I? No, true enough. Otherwise, we wouldn't bother it, with all it, of this. It's called a format, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. So, hmm. following the format point, yes. are you ready with your Fab? Born ready. I'm ready with my flick. Here we go. Fab! <gasps> hmm? Mm. How was that? Ooh. What? Page 304. 304. It's mm. an old favourite, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. We've yeah. been in proximity to this page before. Have we? Uh, well, we'll find out. Richard, have you ever wondered what the stars of your favourite programmes watch on their TVs? Ah, oh, mm hmm Go on. Hmm? Well, wouldn't it be rather strange if they watched the same things that we watch? Okay. As in, yes. imagine, imagine Captain Scarlet yeah. tuning into the latest adventures of Stingray. Or even Professor Bergman enjoying a, a spot of R&R &R and tuning into Space Precinct. Oh, I bet he would, you know. Uh, which, actually, there's a good chance that yeah. by now it may be enjoying a repeat somewhere in September 1999 <laughs> right, in the yes. show, just as the moon broke out of Earth's orbit. Yeah, it could have happened. Yeah. It makes total sense. Sure. And, of course, there's the famous episode of uh, Sylvester McCoy's Doctor Who, you mm. will remember, uh, set in November 1963, where the camera cuts away just as the TV announcer proclaims. And Saturday viewing continues with an adventure in the new science fiction series, <sighs> Doc... Oh! Yes, yes, I do remember that. I yes. see. So they're, they're, they're watching Doctor Who in the Doctor Who universe. It's very I meta, see. isn't it? It's a, lo yeah. it's a lovely little thing. It that. Is nice. But such a thing could never happen in the world of Jerry Anderson, could it? I doubt it. Well, what? I'm afraid to say. Mm. Actually, I'm thrilled to say <laughs> it did. OK, go on. Yeah. Tell me about it. So the Fireball XL5 story, A Day in the Life of a Space General, the mm. one that was colourised by uh, Network many, many years ago, in that uh, episode, Commander Zero's son, Jonathan, is shown watching television while eating his breakfast. And what is he watching? Ah. Only the Four Feather Falls episode, Ambush. I see. Which aired on Earth mm. three years earlier. Right. Though not on not for yes. guys in XL5, no, but actual terrestrial yes, sure. Earth, mm. real world. Earth. Okay. You get it? Yeah, I do. So I suppose it makes sense from a copyright point of view, because if he'd been watching something else, they would have had to pay for it outside of the Anderson stable. Yeah. Um, we also have uh, Dick Spanner being watched on TV in the Lavender Castle episode, The Twilight Tower. Really? I did not know that. But there is another incident where it seems something was included simply as uh, what we might call today uh, an Easter egg. Oh, yeah. For those right. watching at home. Yes. Uh, in the episode Space Pirates, take a look at the bookshelves behind Jonathan's bed as Dr. Venus tells him a story, the more eagle-eyed viewers will spot the cover of a supercar annual, showing that the young lad was a keen fan of the classic Supermarination series. Mm -hmm. Impressive, eh? Yeah. Uh, it's not certain whether the cover matches a real supercar annual, of which there were certainly many, so perhaps in the Fireball XL5 universe, supercar lasted beyond the two series that we'd seen. Oh, wow. And inspired another run of merchandise, okay. possibly. Yes. Yeah. And possibly, you say possibly. Yeah. yeah. Well, who knows? We can but dream. Ah, oh, yes. Lost episodes of XL5. Yeah. That's nice, isn't it? Nice idea. Yeah. But it was all a bit meta. It was a bit meta. It'd be a bit like us listening to episodes of the Jerry Anderson podcast. That hadn't actually happened. <laughs> right. Are there any episodes of Jerry Anderson podcast that haven't actually happened? Because well, we've made quite a few of them. There's a few that got deleted along the way by mistake, <laughs> aren't there? As you'll remember, thanks to audio uh, cock-ups. Yes, so. that's right. Yes, I do remember that. Yeah. There we go. <clears throat> nice. Did okay. you enjoy that? Uh, did I enjoy it? Yes. I mean, it, you, something that happened and I was you, here to witness it. Can you pretend to have enjoyed it? Hey, that was great. Thank you. Acting no, again. I have to say, I do enjoy Fab Facts. I'm getting to like it more and more. Especially, I think it's being in the room with you as you read them out. <laughs> That's what it is. I'm glad that really helps you. Yeah. But uh, yeah, there you go, Posterons. Mm. If you can think of any other instances of that happening, yes. drop us a note, podcast at jerryanderson.com. Yes. Or where it might have fitted or how it could have fitted inside Anderson Cannon. Right. Is there an Anderson Cannon? I'm going to fire Sorry. you out of it in a minute. Sorry. Anyway, shall we uh, bring that one to an end? I think we should. I'm just trying to think what we can end it with. Yeah, I'm not sure either. Mm, it's go on, be then. tricky, isn't it? Go on, lead up to it. Uh, I'm going to pad a bit while yes. we have a think mm -hmm. and uh, reach the very okay. end of, of this week's... <gasps> Alternative <gasps> Fireball fact. XL5 Fact! Uh, uh, that's a bit long, wasn't it? It's a bit elongated. Yeah, I was going to go for screen fact, because it was a screen that they were watching things on. It's a bit generic, um, I thought. Not specific enough. Anyway... 
try better next time. Move on. Great. I look forward to next week's Fab Facts. Can't wait. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, listeners, viewers, you can subscribe to us on whichever platform you're listening to us or even watching us on. I'm guessing that's going to be YouTube. Mostly, yeah. yeah. Why not hit follow or subscribe? Uh, or there's a little bell thing, isn't there, to get new notifications? There is. I don't really understand. Hit the bell. Hit the bell. Hey, hit the bell. Ding. Mm. I was in a Pizza Hut commercial once. Oh. I played a Klingon and I had to say hit the hut in yes. Klingon. Do you know what it is? I still remember all these years later. Uh, uh, please do, Cher. Retsit set plick. Retsit set plick. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I can speak Klingon. Just for that, though. Yeah, that's all I know. Not super useful when joining Starfleet. Well, give it time. Uh, yeah, so, so rate and review us as well. Why not leave us a lovely five-star rating? Let us know how we're doing with a few words of praise. Be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah. Because we like a bit of praise. We, we, it's good for us. We prefer carrot to stick. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Definitely a carrot man. Uh, yeah, uh, and also do get in touch with us at podcast at joeyanderson.com. Now, it's that time of the podcast where we catch up on the Jerry Anderson news. Oh, well, we hand over to other me at yeah. another secret location. How so many weird. more are there, I wonder? Don't worry, there's only Is it one. a different you every week or the same other you? It's the same boring other me. <laughs> That's relief. Yeah, Great. so over to boring other me. Hello, this is Jamie Anderson back again with the latest updates from Anderson Entertainment. So let's jump straight in to this week's Jerry Anderson news. Starting with a recap of last week's Captain Scarlet Day, what an event it was. Now unfortunately, if you were hoping to get your hands on one of the Ron Embleton print sets, they've all sold out. But don't fret, we still have limited numbers of the This Is The Voice Of The Mr. Ons t-shirt and the Martian Menace CD still available, so hurry and place your orders before they're all gone too. In the audio department, we have two exciting mini-album style CD releases coming later this week. We're a big fan of this format, and we know many of you are too, so stand by for action as we prepare to go full power on these super audio releases. Now, we must address a small hiccup that we experienced last week. Regrettably, due to a software error, our inventory t-shirts appeared as unavailable during checkout, despite actually being in stock, so we sincerely apologise for any inconvenience this may have caused you, but we're happy to report that this issue has now been fixed and you're good to go. In the realm of on-demand video, I'm delighted to say that Jerry Anderson, A Life Uncharted is now available to rent or buy on Amazon UK. Visit ander.sun slash uncharted Amazon to get your copy and embark on an intimate journey through Dad's life and career. Well, that wraps up this week's updates from Anderson Entertainment. I'm Jamie Anderson, wishing you a fantastic week ahead. Stay tuned next week for more exciting Jerry Anderson news coming your way very soon. Well, there you go. Wait, See, wait, 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 wait. Excuse what? me, I haven't sung it last week. Oh, you, sorry. You got sorry. on at me for not singing it. And now you're barging in with your size 12s before I've had a chance to sing it. 11s. That was the news. That was the news. Oh, right. you're back in fine voice there. You were Lovely. about to say. Sorry, yes. Mm. Uh, that was interesting, wasn't it? Oh, was that it? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> well, there, there's some news from other me. That's it. That's that's all you were going to say. Yeah, I was just doing a segue. You interrupted I was my doing song. a segue from a segue. Yeah, mm, I'll put you on a segue and push you down the stairs. <laughs> this is the voice of the Podsterons. Now, our lovely uh, listeners and viewers, <laughs> the Podsterons have been emailing us at podcast at jerryanderson Just Very a couple lovely. this week. Because as you'll see, one of them's rather long and very specific. Would you like me to take the long one or do you fancy it? Oh, go? the long one is all yours. <laughs> this, thank you, is from Michael House, who's in Tokyo in Japan. So, dear podcast hosts, that's you and me. Mm. Possibly Chris. It is Chris too. Congratulations on the start of your sixth year of the Jerry Anderson podcast. Mm-hmm. Sixth year mm. with Pod 261. Here are some remarks. Uh, on the Japanese pronunciations mentioned in this pod's oh, no. fab fact segment. Okay. It's probably best that you are doing this because I am, as previously <laughs> mentioned, the king of mispronunciations. Uh, Michael goes on to say, I will do my best to spare you a dissertation on the trickier nuances of English versus Japanese pronunciation. Good. But first, Gattiga. This is a bilingual portmanteau, hinging on the T portion in the middle, at least when rendered in the phonemic English alphabet, as opposed to the syllabic Japanese writing system. Right. The first part is the Japanese word gatai, which, depending on context, can be variously rendered in English as combination, merging, fusion, or similar words to that effect. Okay. The key is the Japanese I, diphthong in this word, which is pronounced like the English word I or the I in tiger, <laughs> the English part of the portmanteau. In addition, the two T's in gatai connote a dropped or silent consonant. 
meaning that there's an unvoiced half syllable in this case between ga and tai. Ga tai, maybe? The unvoiced consonant? Okay. This is opposed to a silent vowel, of which Jap Japanese, of course, has none. I mean, we know that. <laughs> but I digress. He says, yeah, just a bit. And the second part is much simpler. As mentioned above, it is the English word tiger, as in the South Asian feline apex predator. In case Great. You're wondering, uh, put gatai together with tiger, and you get gataiga, with the emphasis on the tai, i.e., gataiga. Gataiga. That's it. As an aside, the show is actually about a team of five racing cars that could combine into a single larger and more powerful vehicle, the titular gataiga. Second, I'm with you. Evangelion. Oh. Here we go, opening another can of worms. First, a G in Japanese, Japanese is always a hard G, never right. a soft J. Okay. Okay. Second, E is always pronounced E, not E, and I is always E, never I. Keep, well, well, keep well, me up. Uh, no. Third, the accent is probably best on the third syllable, i.e. Evangelion. Right. Evangelion. Feel free to ask any further questions or disregard as you deem appropriate. Oh, now he tells me. <laughs> it's too late to disregard no, it I now, didn't Michael. I have a choice. Oh, okay. Uh, be seeing you. And that's from Michael House in well, Tokyo, Japan. Do you know what? Yes. I quite like this email. Oh. Because it's very much in the spirit of all the kind of podstroms in yep. that if we get something wrong or we don't understand something or we miss something, we don't know something. Yeah. They will very kindly fill us in. There's no finger wagging. No. Well, sometimes, but that's normally about other stuff. Yeah. But it's just a very kind. Here's how you do it, in case you wanted to know. So thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. And I'm I apologise in advance. I'm going to get it wrong again in in future weeks. Oh, of course, that's bound to happen. But yeah, yeah they, isn't that nice? We've got all these kind of cultural oh, learnings amazing. and yeah. linguistics and stuff that you'd never normally expect from a, a podcast of this uh, caliber. <laughs> caliber, exactly. Every day is a Jerry Anderson school day. Well, I love it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I've got an email here. Go on then. It's from Yuhan. Oh yes, great yeah. regular contributor. Yeah. Uh, he begins, My time has come. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, and that's from you, Han. Yeah. Uh, no, he says, uh, Yes, uh, anime is my next biggest love alongside Jerry Anderson. And there's some that definitely come to mind. This is in connection with uh, the anime influence yes. uh, that uh, Jerry Anderson just Ra had. Rather topical with a, a Comics Illustrated joining us later Very on. Very much so, yes, yes. Absolutely. Uh, now, he goes on. Firstly, the anime series Sakura Wars, Careful. based on the <laughs> thank yes. you, based on the popular Sega games in Japan, re revolves around an alternate reality set in Japan in the early 20th century, where the women of the Imperial Flower Division provides musical theatre performances for the residents of Tokyo while combating demon spirits in their steam-powered mecha suits. How, what? how did that ever get commissioned? I, amazing. The <laughs> elaborate launch sequences in this show for each series were very, very reminiscent of Thunderbirds. Oh, yeah. Great. Well, there's the connection. Yeah. Next is more regarding a creator than a series, but Shoji Kawamori is well noted for his love of Thunderbirds. He's the main designer for the transforming fighter craft seen in the Macross franchise, which will some may, may know better as Robotech. To bring it full circle, his love of Thunderbirds eventually brought him on to design Thunderbird Shadow for Thunderbirds Argo, the 2015 ITV series. Right, yeah, okay. That's all I can fit into this email before I t turn it into a tome. <laughs> Thank you, Johan. Probably like a tome. Uh, we do, but yeah, this is good. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but this is but a taste of the Japanese adoration and respect for Jerry Anderson. Oh, and uh, it's pronounced Evangelion. Ah, yes, we know. We know, we've just had Michael House from Tokyo who's explained all of that in great detail. Yeah, so thank you, Yuhan, but, but thanks, we, we're, we're doing our best. Excellent. Have an excellent day, regards to Yuhan. Thank oh, you very thanks much. very much, yeah. Uh, um, this is fascinating. I mean, uh, would Lee know much about anime? No. No. Right. No, he's not an anime boy. He's very much TV21, TV yeah. comic, I see. all the kind of the classics from the 60s. Yeah. Uh, very kind of Brit centric, and a little bit of kind of Marvel, Transformers. Oh, um, yeah. Biker Mice from Mars, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I say, yeah, like I know what I'm talking about. But he did, but oh, not yeah. anime. Great. I see. I feel like we're sort of, you know, tapping into something here that's obviously a, a bit of a subset within mm. the Jerry Anderson fandom. Yeah. Uh, you know, the links between J the Jerry Anderson oeuvre and, uh, and anime. Uh, keep them coming in uh, about whatever subject you like, actually, and send it into podcast at jerryanderson.com. Or either I or, or my esteemed co host here will mm. we'll read it out. Well, certainly try to. Yeah, and we'll no try promises. and pronounce it correctly as well. Uh, next yeah. time. Uh, yeah, all for now, but keep them coming in and um, yeah, we'll read them out next time. Uh, but I think it's about time that we head over to Jeff Trace's sofa. Oh, because can't wait. Uh, Jamie, do you want to tell us 
who you've got appearing now. It's a very special guest. Mm. Lee Sullivan's Twitter profile describes him as comic strip and concept artist, occasional rock saxophonist, show off, and all those make him perfect as a guest for the Jerry Anson podcast. He first joined us way back in pod four, but now he's here on the sofa to chat all things Anderson once again. It's Lee Sullivan. Yay! Hello, Lee Sullivan. Hello, Jamie Anderson. It's very nice to have you here. Isn't it? Can you remember last time you were on the Jerry Anderson podcast? I can't really remember this morning, but uh, yes, I can remember that dim and distant time when I when I I, well, I sort of revealed my olfactory uh, fetishes. Yes, you did. We were in a basement bar mm. uh, in a hotel in London. Oh, that's funny. And that was right at the very beginning of the Jerry Anson podcast. And here you are, 260-something episodes <laughs> later. I can hardly believe it, but I'm very pleased you're back again. Uh, Lee, for anyone who doesn't know you, tell us who you are. And you're going to set yourself up here because we're going to make you do this very exciting format point we've got called Super Identification. Uh, and that's going to show us just how much of an Anderson fan you really are. Oh. So give us your Anderson credentials first, and then the pressure's on to perform. Mm, OK. <laughs> uh, my Anderson credentials, you say? Mm. Well, I, uh, apart from being a fan from very early on, I have drawn about four or five years worth of Thunderbirds comic strip for uh, Redan's magazine, and then subsequently done bits and pieces for you, which I think you are aware of. Very. Uh, plus, uh, more recently, the Fireball XL5 anthology uh, story, which were very kind enough to let me write. Well... Didn't have a choice, did I? I didn't ask. <laughs> <laughs> you just did it. I just did it. We'll definitely touch on uh, your presumptive nature. Oh. Uh, but, yes, you are a long-time fan. You've brought a box of props, which we'll get to later. Mm. But... Now it's time to test your knowledge. On the screen, you're going to see a sequence of very short clips. Uh, and you must, as you become aware of what they might be, shout out the title. I'm going to be keeping score. I see. And we'll see if you beat last week's competitor, Ellie. I'm going to be rumbled. Are you ready? Mm, yes. Let's watch the screen. Here is super identification. Oh, that's Twizzle. Very good start. He's off to the races. Ah, Torchy, the wonderful, ghastly boy. Yep. Ah, Four Feather Falls. Ah, Supercar. Oh, and Fireball XL5. Stingray! Stingray! He's doing very well. Ah, Thunderbirds. Impressive. Should have just got that, shouldn't I? The indestructible Captain Scarlet and Joe Knighty. Ah, uh, this was... I've never really seen it, Secret Service. He's 10 for 10. UFO! Or UFO. It's Robert Vaughan with a blue dog in The Protectors. And UFO, uh, Space 1999. This is an emergency. Ah, uh, Terra Hawks. Oh, I can't believe this. Ah, uh, now this is... This is Dick Spanner? Yeah. Uh, oh, this is one from Richards in, isn't it? Space Precinct. This is one I don't know. Hardwick Hall. Harold's. Oh, this is New Captain Scarlet. Oh. Well, Lee Sullivan. Is that 18 out of 19 that you scored there? I'm ashamed. That is seriously impressive. Let me just get your scorecard and write the score upon you, if you don't mind. On me? Yes. Oh. Uh, this is quite impressive. Oh, how there is your score. Please do uh, put that. I wish I was taking this away with me because this is. <laughs> it's a lovely little uh, Scott Tracy esque version of Lee That's Sullivan nice. with his score at 18. So it goes. Ellie's, Ellie's score, you know, it's completely good because she's much, much younger. Than Absolutely. Me. Ellie did very well, but you have rocketed into first place, yeah. which is. Incredibly impressive. I intend to hold that for at least one podcast. Well, th that's definitely possible. Uh, now, the one that you didn't get. Yes, it's, um, you see, I never saw it. And I've only just recently become aware of it, and I still don't know the name, so you'll have to fill me in. It was Lavender Castle. Lavender Castle. Hardwick Hall, that was close. Was it? 
Crichton Ward Manor? No, it was Lavender Castle. So uh, one for you to catch one, but 18 hours and 19 is, is pretty good. It's a sign of a misspent youth. Yeah, you did, a ra you did rather well. Now, your Anderson experience goes back to the early days, as you showed with a bunch of recognising Twizzle and Torchy and Four yeah. Feather Falls. Uh, so I think it's probably worthwhile us revisiting your earliest Anderson memory first. Yeah, well, the, 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 this was a bit tricky thinking about this mm. because uh, I actually remember Twizzle and Torchy and Supercar very clearly. I don't remember Four Feather the Falls at all. I just have seen it since in the lovely colorization version. It's marvelous. I'm going to want to watch a lot more of those. Um, but the one thing that really, the, all of those things I liked, supercars, uh, explosive, um, breaking the sound barrier was fantastic. The sounds particularly stay in my head and the songs, I had the plastic cars we've seen on the earlier uh, Fab Live. Uh, and, um, but Fireball XL5 is the first episode I can actually remember part of. And that was, uh, really etched into my mind in quite a traumatic way and uh, um, for a long time I thought that it was a robot uh, approaching Robert asking him who would like the first groove now that's just a mishearing because I was a kid but yeah. it actually was extremely terrifying to me this that's my misremembering of it yeah. subsequently in fact last year I realized it was in fact plant man from outer space uh, and he says, who is ready for the first, or who, who, who wishes for the first dose, I think, which is very strange. Well, shall we find out exactly what he said? Let's see what he said. We've got the clip of your first memory. Let's hear it. <laughs> oh, look. And it is all my work. My work! Very pretty, I must say. Yes, but you see the chloroform. My own creation is unique. He is the only one. Now I want to make him some companions. And that's where you come in. <laughs> I knew that if I sent the weed to Earth, you would hardly be able to resist the temptation to come to Madeira. You see, you are far too inquisitive. He's greedy. Plum greedy. It's horrible. Not horrible, my dear Venus. You will make a beautiful chloroform. Just one injection of hermochlorophyll formula, and then... But we must be careful not to give an overdose. That would never do. Now, who is for the first dose? And there's no innuendo possible about that particular clip. I don't know why you'd even bring that up. Uh, nothing I can see there. This is all weird. Uh, so just paint me a picture of... Young Lee, how old were we talking when you were sitting in front of this, uh, mishearing well, it? Fireball, I believe, is 62. Mm -hmm. I look over to my colleague Chris, 62. Uh, so I would have been, assuming that I'm remembering it from the first time around, which I think I am, uh, I would have been four. And that, okay, that's really early. Yes. And just paint the picture of young four-year-old Lee watching this. Are you, where, where are you? Are you sat cross-legged in front of the telly uh -huh. with anyone? I would be sitting probably, yeah, we had a very tiny screen, I think, in those days. I, th I believe, this is for the viewers, uh, approximately that kind of size screen. He's making a sort of... About nine inches or something. I was going to say eight or nine, eight so, nine, so yeah, yeah, it's a very good yeah, estimate yeah. there. Well, it's a, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Uh, yeah, so I would be sitting on the floor watching that and possibly drawing, because mm. I was drawing all this stuff, scribbling over everything books, newspapers, wallpaper, carpets, uh, and um, f honing my art to be. And, um, but just completely absorbed by it. I was a real telly kid. I, I just loved watching television and uh, nothing much has changed. Uh, but I would be, um, I was really obsessed. I, I know now that I love moments. There's a moment when Fireball is taking off where there's a just a few sparks coming out of the back end of it. And I, and I explained that to my auntie, my godmother at the time, and uh, 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 I think she must have thought I was completely around the bend. But I, I was saying, yes, and, and now you'll see the sparks. There they go, you know. And so uh, obsessively detailed uh, memory in that respect. Amazing. And that's clearly stuck with you in your future yes, work. It has, hasn't it? And uh, I have a, do, is a prop appropriate now? 
as long as you describe the prop, okay. I would love oh, to yes, see your props. Yes, we are audio as well as video. Okay. So Lee is currently unveiling his very nice collector's shoebox. Shoebox, yes. My, my wife doesn't know I've got this at the moment, so <laughs> it's the only thing to hand. What I have here, from the time, more or less, is the... Now, the, the aficionados will probably recognise this as the kit master, the infamous kit master uh, kit. That was, um, I think you had to send away for, for it. It was probably 13 and sixpence or something. And my father dutifully made it for me because at four it would have been a horrible mess. Um, and this is a revamped version of it. I completed all of this with the, the airbrushing and stuff on here. Uh, so Fireball XL5 um, has Fireball the Junior, which detaches. It's got Steve and, Ve it's rather disappointingly, Venus, as far as I was concerned. I wanted Robert in there, but, um, but you know, I've got used to it over the years. But this was used, I used to, I, there's a period in your, in your childhood where you discard mm. childish things. And I, was pl I, I played with this in the garden and kind of left it there. <gasps> now, two other children who live next door uh, apparently came round one day, found it, they're trespassing. You know, you can't, it's impossible to imagine now. Uh, and they used uh, Fireball, the main body of Fireball, as a hammer. <gasps> oh, no. And they struck and they struck. I don't know if they were hitting each other, but certainly it was enough to break all the fins off and oh, crack the, so the fuselage. And I had to spend... I then spent, in my 20s, I think I managed to start putting it back together while I was working on weekend shifts at British Aerospace. I do apologise, British Aerospace. I did this on overtime. Uh, <clears throat> there you go. The other thing I've got here, which is related, while we're talking about Fireball, is uh, <laughs> are my little Cecil oh. Coleman. <laughs> Tiny little puppets little of puppets. Venus and Steve. On strings, which are now hideously wrapped totally untanglable. Uh, they are... They're absolutely hideous. They are the most hideous representations of, of the characters. They, it's not so much the, the quality of the sculpt is not bad, but the, the hand-painted, this was described as hand-painted hand on the box. Yeah. Uh, now, Venus has been lying in the sun yes. on one side, and, uh, and Steve is, uh, well, Steve, let's put it mildly, is wearing a very loud lipstick. Uh, <laughs> the other thing that really worried me as a kid is that the, because of the puppet nature of these things, they didn't include any limbs. So you have <clears throat> this poor old little, absolutely, almost vac form shrunk trousers and arms. Empty dangling trousers. Empty dangling trousers. They do make very nice kind of wind chimes. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. I think you're reaching for a use of them yeah. there. They also have very worryingly baby hands, Gosh. which are... I mean, these are, really are quite sinister looking. They're horrible, but... They're going to come to life. Yeah, but I have a very soft spot for them because they were, you know, they were my first character dolls. That's, are those actual ones, or have you re, re -bought You have them? to spoil the magic of it, don't you? No, 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 it's, it, th these are... I have repurchased these because okay. uh, of the originals. Um, well, basically, I took all their clothes off uh, um, okay, Lee, then moving on. Uh... <laughs> They're just torsos. It's appalling. Yes, they just get worse. It's amazing how, uh, how limited your choices were in terms of toys back then. Yes. Uh, and that you were happy with such ugly little devils as them. Well, the fireball was wonderful, but those particular things are ghastly. And there, there's a wonderful... I, did, I forgot to bring it along. There's a, a jetmobile as well, which has Steve Zodiac and Liz, uh, Zuni the Lazoon on the back. And um, Steve has got these extraordinary diamond eyes. And so he looks like a complete maniac sitting on his jetmobile. I think he was a bit of a maniac, so that's only right. <laughs> Uh, and I should just say to, to viewers, listeners uh, at home, that Lee has the most incredible man cave you have ever seen. It is packed to the gills, floor to ceiling, and some stuff hanging from the ceiling, I think. Well, yes. Uh, Give it time. With, with all sorts of toys and gizmos and kits and figures. It's, it's absolutely amazing. And you let me play with your... Um, Spinning top thing, didn't you? <laughs> yes. you know what I mean? Yes, the, uh, the wonderful gyroscope. Uh, yeah. I can't remember exactly what it's called. It has a very great, I'll bring that next. 
In 200 or so episodes' time, I'll bring that in. I look forward to it. We can have a play with that, yeah. Anyway, we should move on, uh, because the, uh, our lovely Podstrons have been sending in questions for you. Oh, bless. Uh, and as uh, you may be aware, I, I, we can pull those questions from this beautiful container. Uh, You're going inside the mind of... From the Zelda. mind of Zelda herself. Yeah. Thank you. That's what we should have come up with last time. I was d uh, aching to say it, but I wasn't here. Lee, will you reach in and grab a question and read yes. us out? Um, and let us know the first question from a podstron. God, it really ah, right. smells this that, is... doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I'd like to get around to that later. Uh, Richard Goodborn, uh, when was Lee's last toy sniffing session? <laughs> well, if you just wait a moment. Oh, we can have one live. Oh. There you go. That's very uh, rubbery. It is. There you go. There and then, Richard, was the last uh, Toy Stiff exception for you. Immediately the last one, but I did actually have a little go at Supercar uh, for old time's sake before I came along here to see if it still got the magic. Because yeah. uh, I would explain to anyone who uh, doesn't, didn't see the didn't see the thing last time that we, uh, it's from the 19, it's a Supercar from the time. It was by um, Plaston. It's a vinyl Supercar so that and it has a kind of plug at the end, which is the uh, nose cone. You take that off and you can squeeze 1960s formed decaying plastic. Mm. <laughs> it's a marvellous thing. It's... Every night before bed. Sounds Can't weird, but lovely. Um, <laughs> would you like a yes, another question one. from the yes. mind of Zelda? I hope it's as disgusting as that. Jonathan Bell asks, I watched your interview with YouTube star Doctor Who Guide and it was a very good interview. Thank you so much. Uh, if you could redesign a Doctor Who character, <sighs> which one and what improvements would you like to make to it? Uh, well, if I could redesign... Well, I kind of have a few times. I've redesigned Daleks and I've redesigned the Cyberman... men... people. Uh, uh, what would I like to have a go at? I would... I'd quite like to have a go at redesigning the Ice Warriors, um, not f just to see what what you would come up with, because it, I love the original things, and I, I'm the sort of person that sits there and says, oh, I shouldn't have redesigned that, it was better than the original, but I love actually coming around to it, redesigning things. Yes. But, and to try and think about what you might bring to it now, and with fresh eyes, and with old roomy eyes as well, you know, that what sort of changes you might make. I haven't a clue what I'd do with it, but there you are. I'm sure you do a smashing job. Best combination though, the old the old nostalgic eyes and the new one. And you might be doing some redesigns for us later in the year, mightn't you? Anyway, Ooh. let's not go too deeply into oh, that. Yes, More I from the mind of that. Zelda, please. Yes, 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 okay. Uh, Martin Smith. Hi, Lee. <laughs> As a rock saxophonist and big Roxy music fan, which allegedly I am, mm. uh, what is your favourite Roxy Ferry song that you love playing? Well, I'm sure everyone's very excited to know this. Um, the, the, actually, the one I really love playing is Both Ends Burning, which sums up most of my life up to now. <laughs> <laughs> As I burn the midnight oil currently on, uh, on Daleks. Um, uh, yeah, Both Ends Burning, I love playing that. And we used to have a little contest in the band. I was in Droxy Music Tribute Band for 10 years. And the original guitarist of that, John Ozeroff and I, we, uh, we, uh, we were sort of dueling, dueling guitar saxophone. And I would try to play the longest notes I could without passing out on stage, uh, uh, which, was, which was good fun. So I would, he would be doing and I'd be going for as long as I could hold them. A man of many, many talents. Oh yes, some of them, are, some of them I show the world. <laughs> oh, I'm delving into the mind again. Okay. Oh, another man, Anthony Zetna. Is that Z right? Zetna. Zetna. Okay. Lee, I loved your Berenice Summerfield stylized work. Ooh, okay. And would have loved to see you draw a cartoon. <laughs> So many people have wanted me to draw a cartoon. Uh, I just keep giving them comics instead. Have you ever thought about producing or seeing an animated film of your work? Well, uh, I've, I've sort of done that because the Doctor Who webcasts, which came out in the early, late uh, 1990s, early 2000s, something like that. Uh, I did three webcasts for the BBC of Doctor Who and I provided all the uh, 
illustrations, the background illustrations and the foreground illustrations that then James Goss uh, animated and um, they went out on the internet. Uh, and so kind of in a way I have. Been there, done that. Been there, done that. But also there's been some very nice, mo what they call now motion comics of my work. You've actually produced one yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, that was fantastic to see. It's really exciting to see work being transferred from 2D into 3D or apparent 3D. Um, and I really, really enjoyed that. Uh, uh, Chris Thompson did a lovely rendering of a craft that I'd done in 3D and manoeuvred it around. Now, that was a fantastic thing to see your, what's come out of your head turn into something. It's, yeah. it's beautiful. Part of the magic, isn't it? Mm, it is, yeah. Uh, speaking of coming out of your head, out of Zelda's head, your last question okay, for this part of your interview. I'm try and pluck a female at this one. Well, just pick a good one. Okay. Oh, good. I was right. Willow Lambden Smith. Ah, oh, hello, Willow. Uh, I want to know when he's going to design my John Tracy tattoo for me. Well, <laughs> this can be arranged, Willow. If at the next, very next convention, you're on. Wow. Okay. Yeah. There you go. You heard it here first. He's doing a tattoo design. <laughs> uh, have you done any, any tattoos for anyone? Not actually applying them, but designs. <laughs> yes, it's a hobby of mine. I just scribble on people. Um, Yes, actually, I have. Uh, I, I had one of my drawings. Uh, there was a Dalek I did on a hoverbout that Colin Young, who's a lovely fan of of, art, of Doctor Who generally and a, a collector of artwork, and he's got some of my artwork. And he had a tattoo made on his shoulder, left or right, I don't know which, uh, um, of that. Which, and he sent me a photograph of it, and I was more than pleased to see that. Uh, and then he asked me to, and he commissioned me to do another one, which was of a Cyberman, that's right. <laughs> and I very cruelly gave the Cyberman a lot of cross-hatching. So the tattooist inflicted quite a lot of pain on him for that. You so. cruel man. Yeah, my, my, my artwork is on, I just think greater love hath no person that they use a bit of their flesh uh, for my artwork. It's quite incredible, isn't it? It is I mean, astonishing. <laughs> I've seen you at conventions oh. and lots of people come up and say nice things about your work. Mm. Me included, yes. because as we've discussed, I had your artwork on my bedroom wall when I was seven, eight, nine years old. So I corrupted you early. You did. The yeah. Dark Express of the Cybermen battle, which was right above my bed. Uh, I'm, I couldn't be more thrilled with that. That's, well, that's marvellous. Nor could I. It's a lovely thing. But <laughs> as, a, as a creative, I just wonder how it is for you when people come up and say, oh, there's this lovely thing you did. I love this so much. Are you able to enjoy their nostalgic joy well, through their experience? In, in complete uh, the opposite of how your dad was for mm. it. I know he couldn't get nostalgia at all. Um, but uh, no, I love it because I was intensely interested in all that stuff when I was young. All the comic strips, all the programmes, I loved. I, you know, I immersed myself mm. in them. Uh, and so... I know the effect that those comic strips had on me. I mean, if we're talking about artwork, uh, I know the, the the effect they had on me, and I love the fact that they, it has that effect on other people. Um, and it's uh, the the particular joy because uh, one of the first things I did was Transformers, mm. and although I wasn't a fan of Transformers, of course, all the kids reading it at the time, who were probably between five to twelve or something like that, reading the comic. Uh, back in the late 1980s, uh, they are, of course, all now, you know, handsome young men with their own families and all the rest of it. Uh, and they come up and sometimes they don't know who they're about to see the work of. And when they leaf through my folders and see the Transformers covers, they kind of go a bit weak at the knees. And that is a fantastic moment because that's exactly what I hoped would happen. Not it's not the you don't want the gratification of that per se but i just wanted to know that that stuff had actually burrowed its way into their minds in the same way that all the stuff i appreciated uh, did to me you know yeah. and, there's, there's stuff from old tv 21s that you often re reference as your oh, favorite yeah. things often mike noble yes but is there a favorite a, a fan favorite is there one image or uh, a, a particular vehicle or an angle or a panel from a comic that people often say I remember that. That was my favourite. Uh, yes, there's uh, a lot of it's to do with Doctor Who because that's where my most uh, most of my work was done. Um, 
It's usually a Dalek page, and sometimes the one, the first big splash panel I did of Daleks, which is a Dalek landing, a black Dalek landing on on us on the planet and in his hoverbout. So I was tapping directly into TV Twenty One mm -hmm. because that 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 and the the annual the Dalek books were where the hoverbouts which really only exist in the comic strips, um, come from. And I've recently uh, just redesigned another, the Hoverbouts again for the uh, current run, which I'm doing of Doctor Who magazine uh, for the Daleks. I redesigned the, the Hoverbout to look like it might have been designed by the Imperial Daleks. And I made the stupid error of doing that because it's a hexagon and very polygonal, polygoni if that's a word. Which it is now. It, I don't think anyone's going to use it again, <laughs> if it is. But um, yeah, that was a big mistake. It's really difficult to draw. <laughs> but yeah, so that that's one of them. Um, also, but the main one really is the Usual Suspects, which is the Doctor Who lineup. Yeah. And of course, I've done a Usual Suspects lineup for the Anderson uh, world, uh, both heroes and villains. Yeah, and they're really lovely things. Uh, oh, did you hear that sound? Well, my hearing's going a bit. It was very loud. You definitely heard it. Oh, yes. That means, Lee, it's time for your quick fire five. <laughs> I'm going to give you a, a, a quick list of five either ors you must choose rapidly, and your choice is locked in forever and can never be gone back on. Are you ready? Yes. Would you rather draw Oink from Stingray in a Spectrum uniform or Colonel White as a furry seal? Oh, Colonel White as a furry seal, obviously. Knew it. Knew it. Would you rather know all of Lady Penelope's secrets or help Master Spy steal Supercar? Actually, I'd like to help Master Spy. Knew it. Yeah, Supercar through, fans through and through. Even the studio prop. Fair. OK. Choose from the opening titles of Captain Scarlet or the closing titles of Firewall XL5. Oh, that's cruel. Uh, Mm, uh, closing titles of Fireball, but because the theme is the song. so wonderful, and the animation. And one of the great things about that for a kid was almost forgetting week by week that Fireball actually goes around the earth mm. towards the end. Oh, that was a brilliant idea. What a great thing. And all those views of the, of the, of the planets, the close-ups of the moons, the, the sudden zoom shots, yeah, the crash zooms, fantastic. There you go, he really loves it. Uh, your doctor needs to give you a prescription. Oh. Would you rather that he gave you Space 1999 anti-radiation pills or Fireball XL5 oxygen oh, pills? oxygen pills. There yeah. can be no doubt about that. I'd, useful, though, I want know. to float around outside the hull. And finally, you must now pick a colour from the Dulux paint range and become a Spectrum agent of that colour. Are you Captain Vanilla Scoop or Captain Purple Pout? Mm, there's no, there's no Captain Brown in there. It, those are your only choices. Uh, I think, I think vanilla. I'm, I'm a fairly vanilla. Really? Guy. Yeah. Well, there you go, Lee Sullivan. That's your quick fire five. Well done. Very impressive. <laughs> uh, now we are running out of time for this oh, session, but yes. will you come back next week? Yes, if I have to. You absolutely must. In fact, we'll probably make you stay right there for seven days. Shall I wear the same T-shirt then? If you could, for uh, okay, continuity. continuity that would be great, thank you. We look forward to that. Uh, until then, where can, can people find you online if they want to stalk you or see your work? <laughs> I like stalkers. It's, uh, it's a, a, a new thing for me. Um, <clears throat> I am on Facebook uh, as Lee Sullivan. Also Lee Sullivan Art, but go to Lee Sullivan. There's a picture of me and my uh, ex-dog. Uh, and um, <clears throat> I'm also on the web. I've got a website, which is Lee Sullivan Art. And uh, that should get you to me. I'm on Twitter. I never use the thing. We always tag you on Twitter and you always ignore it. So I'd never don't follow him on Twitter. I don't, I don't look at Twitter. No. No. That makes sense. No interest in it at all. Anyway, next time, Lee, we're going to talk about Fireball XL5 and comic stuff that you've been doing more recently through the First Action Bureau and what might come next, maybe. <laughs> but for now, Lee Sullivan, thank you very much indeed. Oh, my pleasure. Oh, thanks, Lee. He's it's always back. nice to have Lee around. It is always nice. And don't worry, he's not Why? going anywhere because he's going to come he? back next week. Well, I hope he is going somewhere. He's not going to stay here for 
all week. We're just getting waiting. on the sofa. It looks very comfy. Fair enough. Actually, it's a bit firm, isn't it? It's just good, firm. Good for a bad back, though. Has he got a bad back? Yeah. Oh, well, there we so are. That's going to help him out. Great. Help so thanks, Lee. More yeah. next week. Yeah, more next week. Now, I'm just going to head on over to our Facebook group. That's facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Podstrong. Good idea. Where lots of our wonderful Podstrongs have been t- uh, posting. Matthew Mayhew, for example. Well, that space precinct finished, he says. I don't think that's like, you know, well, that's it. That's all. It's over. <laughs> it's, uh, I Cancelled. think he means he's been watching it ah. and he's finished. And as predicted, my average rating puts it as my second highest rated show behind Space 1999. I mean, I'd agree. All thanks to its stars. Yeah. The variety of stories helped keep the series interesting with ambitious storytelling. This helped, as they could have gone down the route of police procedurals just in space. I think The Fire Within is one of the best stories in all sci-fi, not just in Anderson. Directed wow. by uh, John Glenn, of course. Of course, another lovely John Glenn. podcast host. Uh, guest, rather. Oh, wouldn't it be great to have John Glenn as a host? Maybe we can have guest hosts in. Mm. Oh. Uh, the attention to detail that the mask makers had to create unique Tarns and Creons, even for minor characters, helped make the world more impressive when they probably didn't need to go that far. Yeah, probably true. It's a shame that we didn't get a second series of this. Definitely deserved one. Agreed. It would have allowed more stories focusing on Haldane and Castle and one focusing on Turk or Fredo. Mm. Mm. Right, well, he's missed someone out there, but never mind. Uh, now to read and listen to Richard Jane's extensions to the universe. Are there any more Space Precinct alumni around for podcast interviews? We've talked about this, haven't we? Yes. Also, hats off for Rob Youngblood and Simone Bendix for being able to do all those action scenes in those tight trousers and knee-high boots. Fair enough. Anyways, off to the worlds of animation to round out my Andiverse journey. And that's Matthew Mayhew, who's been enjoying Space Precinct. Amazing. Nice. Second favourite after Space 1999. Can you oh, believe it? That's brilliant, yeah. I'll take I can, that. I can just about believe it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, other... Well, I mean, we should, yes. We'll try and get um, some people... I mean, uh, Mary Woodvine would be great. It'd be yeah. trouble getting, a, 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 you know, the, the Americans over, I would think. But, mm, um, but if they're visiting... Yeah, who knows? Never say never. Never say never. OK. Yeah. Uh, I've got a Facebook post here mm-hmm. from Gareth Randall, if you'd like it. Oh, uh, cool. Well, he's posted an oldie but a goodie. Oh, yes. Joe's 90. Oh, yes, go on. Former TV star Joe 90 celebrated his 90th birthday yesterday with a quiet retirement party in Filey, North Yorkshire. Joe, who during the 60s starred in his own television show, has not been able to walk unassisted since his leg strings snapped in the late 80s. <laughs> but staff at the Bayview Retirement Home say that he's in good spirits and was able to enjoy a glass of champagne on his birthday. 90's wife, Rhapsody Angel, uh, out of Captain Scarlet, sadly <laughs> died in 1992 following a long bout of woodworm. Oh, <laughs> Joe, oh. Joe so bad. Joe was forced uh, to sell the giant food mixer in which he sat at the beginning of the TV show to pay for her funeral. <laughs> the couple had no children. Oh, sad, sad notification there. <laughs> what? Isn't that funny? I mean, it, it, it is, but it's, it's also a bit dark. It is a bit dark, isn't it? But it makes you wonder what happened to our favourite, uh, you know, stars from our favourite shows. Perhaps sometimes it's best not to know. Uh, best not to ask. Mm, yeah, maybe not. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah, great. Thanks, Gareth, I think. Uh, now, do pop along to our Facebook group. Uh, it's a fantastic place to hang out. You can post all your pictures of your latest merch. And even mm. your cosplay mm. and your models that you've mm. been building and your events visitor, you're going to, events, exactly. fan fiction you're writing, oh, yeah. weird sort of semi obituaries that you're writing about characters, <laughs> anything you like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so we'll see you there. Um, in the meantime, I think it's that time that everyone's been waiting for. Is it really? Yeah. No, it's not time to go. I was about to leave out of my chair. But it's the next best thing. It's time for the randomizer. Oh, Chris, over to you. Mr. Sullivan, report to the podcast studio. Reporting as ordered, sir. Hello, hello. How nice to see you. Nice to see well, you. Well, you are, of course, familiar with this article right oh, here, yes. aren't you? This is the Jerry Anderson podcast, Randomizer. The famous Randomizer. The very famous one, yes. And in here we have every Jerry Anderson television episode and feature film ever made, blah, 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 blah. Would you like to press the button for us today? I certainly would, Chris. Yes, and we'll see. Here we go. Was that the right button? <laughs> It wasn't the same as last week, but we'll okay. go with it. That's fine. Well, strangely, it does the same I don't thing. know what half of the buttons on here do. No. So, anything you're hoping to see come up today? Uh, well, I'm hoping for a touch of Robert Vaughan. Well, that's a bit controversial in some sectors. What have we got here? Oh, well, it's The Protectors, and the episode is... I believe it's Quinn. I could go off you, you know. It especially for you, Chris. Thank you very much. Well, I did not want to see this one come up today. There are several episodes of The Protectors that I really just have dreaded for a long time having to talk about. Uh, oh, cute doggy. Hey, doggy. Well, 
Max, oh no, that's not the name of the dog. Um, yes, this from season two, and also A Case for the Right from season one. Um, largely because I find both plots absolutely impenetrable. Uh, this, I believe, was the first episode made for season two, and I have seen it described, I think it was on dvdreviewer.net, which I suspect is not running anymore. Uh, they reviewed this episode, I think they gave it like a three out of ten, saying that it was either the second half of a two-parter or just the most impenetrable piece of outsider art that they had ever experienced. But we open with, I'm guessing this is Madrid, uh, a chap on the run from Brian Glover and friend, and, uh, <laughs> and this little kid. Got to get that little kid off the street. Uh, as I recall, this episode does have um, a, a nice guest cast in the sense of, you know, Brian Glover's here and uh, someone else familiar to British audiences will, will be along shortly. But it's not looking good for this guy. Um, Ooh. Yes, this is another reason I, I, I feel, and I, I'm sorry, I do feel that I let the side down a bit with my unfamiliarity with the protectors, but I think a lot of why that is, is because I was holding out for, for Blu-rays uh, and I was postponing it, like with other ITC shows, um, Strange Report and The Champions, I've been holding off re-watching them in case anything in the Blu-ray department comes along. But he's mentioned Quinn. And you can tell that that mention of Quinn was very serious because it got the freeze frame before the opening titles. There we go, there's our other notable guest star, Peter Vaughan uh, of uh, Porridge fame. It was Harry Grout in that. I mostly, actually my abiding memory of him, aside from being a villain in a lot of these ITC shows, is when he played Anthony Hopkins' father in Remains of the Day. And there's that horrible shot of him serving someone a meal and you just see this little drop of water forming on the end of his nose and it like drips down in slow motion. Oh. You see, I'm, I'm coming up with all sorts of brilliant memories for this one. But, uh, yes, uh, assuming this is Madrid, Harry is here, the Contessa is here, uh, Bubbles are here. Um, a lot of people who I suspect don't know that they are on camera. And uh, I, I don't know how long she would have been in the country before she started filming this, but Nari Dawn Porter looks, uh, looks quite tanned in this episode. Rosemary and Thyme. See, I have to sing there because I know that even though you all love my singing, uh, the YouTube copyright goblins will probably catch that little snippet of Simon and Garfunkel in the background. So, Rosemary and Thyme. So, it's just kind of hanging around in Madrid for a bit. Um, oh, ZZ. This is significant to Man with Moustache. Robert Vaughan is also looking very tanned. Sun. Or just pink. Again, I think this is why I, I still want this on HD because some of the, the flesh tones are a bit See. overdone in this restaurant. Who designed it? One de Bologna or one Pasquale de Mania? Hmm. No answer to that. Yeah, this episode kind of starts out in sort of in situ events are already playing out, and I don't think it helps our understanding of things. I can kind of understand why they've done it. Because a lot of the time with the protectors, I think I've said this many times before, they're not quite long enough to support the story. So they've decided this time, well, let's just start with the story already halfway through and just trust the audience to pick it up as they go along. I don't think it quite works. I also recognize uh, this little chap here, but I can't think of the name, which is annoying. Hmm. So, Harry rules little uh, signal with the, what was it, straws or something there? ZZ. Yes, that meant something to that waiter. Hmm. This calls for a, another very 70s gentleman, a very 70s looking sunglasses and moustache combo. A taxi? Yes. Well, do you know what's going on? I don't know what's going on. Hmm. May as well follow. I'm here with a friend, a good friend. Then he's a good friend of Michael. An American called Harry Rule. We've been looking for a man, Quinn. <gasps> oh no, it's even more serious now. We've gone to slow motion, freeze flame, black and white for some reason. Uh, needless to say, they're building this Quinn guy up to just massive hype levels. 
And even though it's, it's Peter Vaughan, they're not going to quite carry it off, I don't think. Uh, I apologise to anyone out there for whom Quinn is, is their absolute favourite episode. I, I have tried to engage with it before, and I suspect that the story itself is quite simple in that they are just looking for this criminal mastermind named Quinn. Um, but it kind of, I don't know, the way the story is told and the, the layers to it, it's a very simple idea told in a very convoluted way. <sighs> I do try with the protectors. I do like it. It's just some of these stories are a bit, oh, a bit impenetrable. So Harry has wandered into the arena and he's having his photo taken in his lovely beige jacket and brown tie. Not many men can pull off beige, brown and blue in the same setup, but uh, he's managing it. Has anything happened in this episode? Oh, who's this? It's another guy with a I'm fancy Harry Roach. I'm looking for Quinn. Well, that went down like a Mr. glass of nothing. Be careful. I don't need to listen to that from a man with a pink tie. His tie matches the color of his hands. So, um. Here we have a montage of guest artists asking questions. And again, I doubt any of these people know they're on camera. It's so fun, yeah. The protectors hire someone else to go out and do the work for them. Hello. Harry. I expected you earlier. Yeah, I just made contact. With Quinn? Not yet, but now I know he's here. Me too. Paco went white when I mentioned his name. Quinn no, he went kind of black and white. It's the currency he uses. He's an international disease. Harry, don't let this get too personal. When that happens, you lose perspective. Wait, you and then we have to get you to hand in your badge because you're a loose cannon and you're off the force. I had a cable from Paul. He's due in this afternoon. Oh, hurrah. Senor What next? We wait. Senor Rul. Senor Rul. Doesn't look like they have to wait for long. Yeah. It'd be handy if I knew where these two were in relationship to each other. It's a wonderful way to run an investigation. You just sit back at the hotel and wait for people to bring you clues. So who's this? Oh, it's the waiter guy again. Lots of furtive glances and uh, concerned, meaningful looks this week. Um, okay, so now the uh, Harry and the Contessa are actually on camera together. This is uh, the first time it's happened so far this episode. I mean, to their credit, none of the, uh, the people in the background actually seem to recognise Robert Vaughan. Again, there's no way, I think, in, in a situation like this that you could actually control the activities of passers-by. Um, oh, here comes our man with the pink shirt again. That was a very quick cutaway. Was that a clue that he's going to... I think he might be about to snatch the Contessa. Well, another abandoned house. Oh, no, not so empty. We have a thug. Uh, may as well stroll on in and see what we can do. Nice soundtrack in this episode, I, I give it that. Um, I do one of my favorite soundtrack releases, and sadly it is not available anymore, hasn't been for a while, is the uh, is Network's release of the Protector's soundtrack, because it's a five disc. It's one of those every note ever collections. Have a proposition, Mr. Rule. And this has a nice score. Quinn. I'm Quinn. I said no. Is that the same guy with pink tie from earlier? Yeah. Do they have two guys I with pink ties, or did I get that one outside confused just then? <laughs> well, Harry has strolled into the enemy camp. What's the Contessa doing? She's in a pet shop. Uh, as a car approaches, with a speedy. Stop. All oh, right. Okay. Harry's being bundled into the car. I was assuming the Contessa would have been snatched uh, while Harry was in there. Oh, and it's times like this where the Contessa appreciates she doesn't have Chino around anymore to give her a lift because uh, Chino, along with uh, Suki, they were both dropped between seasons. Um, obviously, neither of them added much to the, the plots of the stories. I suspect also part of it may have been the You've, you're going to now have 52 episodes. You can show these in random order and you wouldn't get a sense that those two characters are necessarily gone. 
But speaking of characters who are gone, the Contessa has lost Harry. Well, without melodrama, this episode doesn't really have much going for it. Because there's a lot of build-up to this, this character, almost like he's you know, the king of the, the criminal underworld of the Protectors. And I can think of at least, well, half a dozen characters off the top of my head who are far more menacing within this series. Oh, another thug. Same thug. See, it, it doesn't help that the thugs in this show, okay, they, a lot of them wear different clothes, but they all have the same face. It's hard, to, uh, it's hard to keep track of them all. So, um, generic thug number five has followed Contessa and Little Guy to railway sidings to meet man in blue overalls painting a train blue. And the thug can't allow any of this to, to go on. And the blue man is scarpered. And I do always like in old shows, and I don't think they do it so much anymore, is when you can have chase scenes in and around like railway sidings and stations and such and actually crawl underneath or behind the trains and rolling stock. I think there's, a, there's probably a few in the protectors. No, this is the protectors. A few in the professionals. Uh, and I think there's a really good one in an episode of Gideon's Way. Anywho, um, little man has been shot, uh, only injured I think. Caroline is still free because the blue man the blue thug man, sorry, can't find her. Um, everyone's kind of trying to work out where everyone else is now. Contessa's hiding. Here comes blue thug. Hmm. So everything hinged on that one guy painting a train. Without him, the whole case just falls apart. Nice low angles on this, this sequence, though. Really getting the sense of scale uh, of these these locomotives and again I think going back to was it Bagman which had the the location work with all the tubes uh, some nice use of location settings and again it makes me wonder was this having it set around a, a, a railway yard written into the script or is this a happy accident that they found a, a suitable location to make a good uh, chase sequence because it's getting quite tense now I'm surprised to hear myself saying that because I've always had this one sort of pegged as your know, very bottom uh, of the list protectors. It's proving slightly better than I remember, but yeah, again, I think they're just kind of overselling the villain. Who need I point out we have not actually met yet? Oh no! Well, they'd oh, nearly made their getaway. The Contessa's fallen and Little Man is going to panic and leave her. The Contessa has lost the use of her legs entirely. Oh no! Thug is going to shoot her? No. Her main character immunity status is secure. So Brian Glover has now brought Harry Rule to a nice little villa. Um, way out in the middle of nowhere. I suspect this might be to meet old Quinn. Lots of walking into rooms slowly in this episode. Ah, another generic thug. Oh, and there's our man. There is Quinn himself. Peter Vaughan, yes. He's a very good actor and a very fine villain in a lot of these ITC shows, but he's, he's turned up what? I guess we're about eight minutes from the end of the episode. And again, he is wearing a dodgy moustache as well. <sighs> so, let's just sip our wine. What do you think? Hmm. Rather uh, thin texture, smooth. I can't tell the color. Too uh, sweet. Hmm. Well, they've hit it off. You want to talk to me? In private. Uh, briefly, this became a uh, food and drink type show. We have a lot of wine on the table. So, this is what it's all been building to. The man we've well, been searching for. It's taken me two months to find you. For two months? I'm a very private person. Mm. Mm. And you are the most influential and feared man in the international mercenary world. 
You've made a fortune out of war, genocide. Yeah, and it's kind of, um, we're just kind of being told all this stuff about Quinn without really seeing any of it for ourselves, uh, other than the fact that we know he has a lot of thugs with the same basic um, get up. Mercenary parachute group. Hmm. Police to the highest bidder. I need your idea. I was also impressed when Harry said it had taken him two months to track down Quinn. Oh, Paul's arrived in his uh, black and gold spotty cravat. Yeah, it's taken two months to track Quinn down when all they really needed to do was go to his hometown and just kind of ask around. Yes, I kind of wish... Uh, and I feel a bit bad for saying this. I kind of wish that Brian Glover possibly could have played Quinn because I like the... Um, the slightly demented, um, cruel streak that we saw in the character. Oh, you're on the place to train? Yeah. Here she is. Alive and well. And I believe... Oh, yes, they have to Sutton. act as if they don't know each other. My name is Laura Sutton. Hmm. Miss Sutton. Oh, so he's gotten wise to her. Which means... Oh, now Paul has to go around asking people questions. Yes. Because one montage like this in the episode wasn't enough. We have to have two. Uh, as poor locals are interrogated and harassed. Oh, this woman is not enjoying it. She just wants to get home and uh, get this washing sorted out. Again, nice, nice direction here. There's a very interesting shot. But it's a lot of... It's a lot of work and a lot of interesting imagery in the service of a very thin plot. To be fair, I understand the plot a bit more this time. Uh, it's not as impenetrable as I remembered. I just think they've, they've oversold this character. Decided to mind my business. Because although, as I said, Peter Bourne is a, is a great actor, this, this isn't his finest performance and I think it's just a, a lack of material to engage with. Now, who are you? Is that a B? Is that on the episode or is that in here with me? Yeah, more Bs. Hmm. I do like parts of this finale, though. Um, there's doing the old thing. You I think it's need my help. been done in Bond you films and such. Me. Oh, you yeah. hero yeah, of the show, really shoot this person who is your colleague that I don't know right. is your colleague. Um, and although Robert Vaughan remains uh, typically solemn, uh, I think Nairi Dawn Porter does a really good job of, of selling the fear here because she knows if Harry doesn't go here. through with this... There's no one for me. He's, uh, well, he'll get it in the back first from uh, Brian oh, Glover's okay. shotgun. And, you know, she doesn't want to throw away two months of work. Again, this is a good example of why this show would look great remastered in HD. I think the, if you just see in this shot, the skin tones the on Brian Glover and Robert In Moore. front of a witness. You would have something on me, I wouldn't like that. They're far too pink. And I don't know how much better the show could look in HD, but this was 16 millimeter, sure. and the professionals were 16 millimeter, and you almost can't in tell. It, it's almost indistinguishable from 35 millimeter. I'd like to think that this could be scrubbed up and look really great. No. Oh. You win. Oh dear. Yes, we've got to do that bit as well. The, uh, the fake outs. Robert Vaughan just seems a bit confused when every time it cuts back to Nori Dawn Porter, she is acting her socks off. But it does lead to something that I've mentioned before with the second series of The Protectors, is that there are so many downbeat endings when someone... Oh, there goes Quinn. Yeah, someone ends up crying or dying or both. Um, so Paul has taken out Quinn and Brian Glover and the Contessa, well, it's all too much for her. And I, I kind of like this type of ending as a one-off, but... They kind of got to doing it every single week or every other week in the second season. And I'm not sure I'm, I'm too keen on it. Because I like actually on ITVX, if you look up the show on ITVX, the description is 
chipper detective show, and I kind of like that. So there was Quinn, um, slightly better than I remembered. Louis Barbu, that's a nice name for a taxi driver. But it's still never going to be one of my favourite episodes, unfortunately. I am really happy to be done with this one. It's been looming over the randomizer for quite a long time. Uh, so I'm glad to get it out of the way, but I will give it credit, it wasn't as bad as I remembered. Still not great, unfortunately. Nothing better than a bit of Tony Christie to round out an episode no, of The Protectors, because no. the rest of it yeah. Yeah, leaves do you think, something to be desired. Do you think it peaks with the opening titles? I mean, when Harry Rule's dog comes up, that's the best bit for oh, me, because he's yeah. very much like my big old oh, boy, isn't he? That's yeah, right. So. Yeah, that's nice, isn't it? But yeah, yeah well, there we go. Yes, yeah, a strange sort of um, sidestep from the Jerry Anderson universe, as we know it. Yeah, but it's, you know, it, yeah. it still belongs, yeah. but it's sort of like a, an awkward kind of cousin that nobody See, likes talking to. The awkward relative that comes to the funeral. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, you're nice here, are you? Yeah, mm. that's right. Uh, yeah, great. So more Randomizer next week, of course, when he'll be picking another random episode from a random Jerry Anderson series from The Randomizer. Thank you for explaining the format. <laughs> I did. Maybe I should have done that before. Mm, this one, the randomizer. Never mind. Anyway, yeah. Uh, but that's all for now. Uh, we'll be back next week. We've got the second part of an interview with uh, Lee Sullivan. With yeah, Jeff Tracy's lovely, sofa, of course. Lovely Lee. Why am I the only one calling it Jeff Tracy's sofa? Oh, sorry. I'll be, yes, looking forward to sitting down with Lee on Jeff Tracy's sofa I think next it works. week. I think that works. Yeah, great. In the meantime, keep your emails coming in podcast at jerryanderson.com. Post on our Facebook group and also on our YouTube channel. And why not hashtag us Jerry Anderson Podcast on the old Twitter? Or the new Twitter. Yeah. Any Twitter you like. Yeah, but whatever it'll be by then. Something Good. else probably. Mm, okay. Yeah. Until then, see you next week. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. Can I drink my coffee now, please? Drink your coffee. Have you been waiting that whole podcast for your coffee? I was so thirsty the whole time. And I thought, if I have it, you'd tell me off. Oh, you were very brave. Oh, let's hear it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, that's good, isn't it? (sighs) Oh. (laughs) Aren't these mics great? We're back to this ASMR thing. (laughs) Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank goodness for that. Feel better? I do, but I'll let you in on a secret, Posterons. Right. Richard James now is producing quite the slave drive. Am I? Yeah. I don't even reach down yeah. for my coffee in case he well, cracked the whip and it, told me off. Mm, it's all about the schedule. We've got to get them done, Jamie. Okay. Well, it's, it's yeah, we've got to get them done. So drink your coffee. Come on. Okay. Be quick, so I've got to go and edit it and then okay. publish it. Sorry, so, getting on now. Yeah, right. Bye. Ah, oh, pay peanuts and get monkeys. That was an Anderson Entertainment production. <laughs>